Welcome to this webinar on talent development organized by the French American Chamber of Commerce New England chapter in collaboration with Stratex EXL. We are going to leave two minutes for participants joining now in the waiting room to join us. In the meantime, I invite you to share any information that you'd like to to, to share with the other uh, attendees, such as your location, your company name, or responsibilities. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, before I give the floor to uh, Philippe Letapi, um, who is the managing director of Stratex EXL and a board member of the French American Chamber of Commerce in New England, I'd like to share some best practices for this webinar with you. This webinar will be recorded. The presentation by Philippe Latapi will last 30 minutes, followed by Q&A. We are expecting some interactivity uh, by the attendees during this webinar. If you have a question, please use the chat menu and send them to me, Ludivine. I'm the executive director of FACNI in Boston so that I can invite you to unmute and ask your questions live directly to Philippe after the presentation. Please wait for, for me to give you the floor and stay unmute while non-speaking. Finally, if you have any technical glitch or the meeting is disconnected, reconnect with the same link again. Thank you for your attention and Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Ludivine, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, having this uh, webinar with you today. I see that we have uh, participants from uh, or attendees from across the US, uh, New England, uh, the Northwest, uh, Dallas area. So welcome to everyone. Uh, so I'm um, uh, the managing director of a company called Stratex EXL, and EXL uh, stands for Experiential Learning. Uh, we are a pioneer of experiential learning uh, that we uh, typically um, empower or enable through immersive business simulations. So we have offices in Boston and Paris. We are a global team. I've got a colleague actually joining me here uh, on this webinar, Sebastian, who is based in our uh, Boston office. And uh, we've been actually doing um, e-learning programs for the past 15 plus years. We've had programs with as many as 45,000 people enrolled in uh, some programs. And so I'm really um, pleased to be able to share with you some of our experience uh, running this, uh, this type of remote learning, remote learning, uh, especially in today's context. I think a lot of people um, uh, are starting to think about uh, how to do more online, obviously. Um, so, so the topic is really uh, thinking about how do we create engaging learning experiences online and thinking about key factors that drive, uh, so we, we, yeah, we'll talk about a number of topics uh, to try to build our understanding here. First, thinking through what are factors that drive learning engagement in general, you know, regardless of the modality, whether it's um, in person or uh, online. What are these factors? Then uh, we'll think about, uh, can they be included in an online environment? Um, also, um, in our case, we, we work with a lot of uh, large corporations uh, for leadership development programs. And sometimes our clients are um, you know, a bit hesitant about uh, using uh, online learning for senior level audiences. So let's, let's take a look at the needs of uh, a senior level audience and see what are maybe the specifics here. Uh, and then uh, I'll share with you some examples of uh, an example of an online learning journey. And we'll hear from you as well about uh, other thoughts you have on uh, potential best practices you've seen in, in this space. We'll uh, wrap up by talking about supporting technologies and I'll uh, talk as well about business simulations as part of those technologies. So um, with that in mind, as a roadmap, uh, I wanted to uh, start a conversation first on those factors that drive learning engagement. So I'll have you, um, I'd like to get a little bit of your perspective here, um, you know, reflecting on the best training program you ever had. And I'm not talking about uh, necessarily online, best training program 
uh, if you can reflect on the various training uh, programs you had throughout your uh, your career um, you know what is it that made it special special why was it so great what made it special now uh, to um, to do this you know in fact we uh, we are going to um, use a virtual breakout so I'm going to uh, have you um, work in small teams uh, of three people per team, and I'll give you five minutes to um, discuss this question together. So first, you know, um, get, make sure you, uh, you introduce each other within the small group of three, uh, and then uh, think about that question, discuss that question, and uh, make sure you have a, a spokesperson ready to share on behalf of the group at the end of the five minutes. You'll get a heads up uh, 30 seconds before we uh, regroup everybody in the same in the same room. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started with the breakouts. Um, Manon, if you can. So welcome back to the main room. I hope you enjoyed this exercise. Uh, so let's let's see if we have um, uh, people who can speak uh, on behalf of the, their group. You know, share their story. I can start if you want, Philippe. Okay, thank you. And who is this? Marianne. 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 Oh. Yeah. Hi. I mean, I <laughs> Bonjour. Um, yeah, there were three of us, Carol and Anna, on our group, and uh, uh, the first thing we said was relevance, uh, relevance to what we're actually working on, um, and being uh, being timely in the way that we could actually apply what we were learning. Um, the other aspect, which is similar to that, is the kind of it being experiential, so we can kind of try it on, try it while we're, when we were, when we were learning, we're actually doing it as well, in an experiential way. Um, but Carol pointed out uh, that sometimes those experiential exercises can be a bit too complicated, uh, so you have to be careful to adapt them for the, for the medium that we're using. Um, which brings us to the fact that people do people like to learn have different modes of learning. So training where there is more than one modality uh, is really helpful to uh, so that people can choose the one that they actually prefer working with. And uh, the the last thing, the very the very end, we were we were kind of rushing at the end, but was it's good when you're kind of getting feedback. Um, when you get feedback in the training program itself. Okay, very good. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, anybody else wants to share for the group? Please jump in. Yes, Fabienne would like to share our experience. Thanks, Ludivine. Yeah, it was the four of us. And um, we talked about a structure, having something which is quite uh, structured, and that the trainer is really professional, meaning organized and engaged. We also talked about experience and gamification there, uh, freedom of, of pace so that we have some, you know, uh, freedom to, to learn as we want. And it comes back to the learning um, style. We have uh, different personalities, hands-on and game and um, breakout rooms are very welcome because you can learn a lot from direct interaction with people too. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so then we have uh, Elliot uh, from uh, Daso System will we'll share for his group. So yes, I think I may be the only one who is still currently enrolled at a university. <laughs> and um, because of COVID-19, uh, all of my classes are actually online right now. So I, I've had a lot of experience with it in the past couple of weeks. Um, I will say my two big takeaways were that I, I really enjoyed how flexible the lectures were because now for three out of my four classes, the lectures are just recorded online and you can listen to them whenever you want at your own pace and however many times you want. So I really like that where you kind of get to enjoy the process of learning because you get to learn at your own pace. Um, one thing that I did not like about it though was that it felt um, more unengaging than being in the traditional classroom environment because I felt as though when you're in the traditional classroom environment, you're with other people that are learning, you can see the professor, so it feels like a more engaged discussion, as opposed to when you're just listening on your own, whether it be you could be in your pajamas <laughs> in your bed, um, it would be sometimes it feels slightly 
less engaging and just as though you're watching like a YouTube video or something. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a Geraldine next for another group. Yes, okay, hi. I was with Amanda and Miriam. So besides the experiential um, learning that was also brought up, um, another um, value training was based on simulation that allows you to have feedback in real time. And also I would say peer learning. Well, you know, people in your working environment, you know, can teach you, you know, they have different skills, you know, skill sets can be shared also, um, you know, within teams or, or teams next door, you know, but, but in your working environment also very valuable um, asset for, for, for training. And also was um, brought up the, the value of um, benefiting from a very good coaching, you know, from good coaching, whether it happens maybe at the beginning or after in your career, but good coaching, simulation, peer learning, um, yeah, on top of experiential learning. All right, very good, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, thank you, Geraldine. And uh, we have uh, Luisela for our group. Oh, you, uh, you're muted, Luisela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're good now. You were muted earlier. No. Okay, I, I'm okay now. I, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I agree with all the points which have been put forward, and I'll just go back to, first of all, the point of care, to actually caring for each particular participant, uh, having a personal interest in them. And the second point, relevance. I, my experience was simply to, uh, for the Ministère de l'Education Nationale, I, I, I devised and led some uh, summer training courses for history teachers in France who wanted to also be able to teach bilingually in English. And what I was saying is that they didn't just need the better language skills, they needed the appropriate specific skills for history teachers. So. Uh, the, they, they were put in, into contact with, with the, their counterparts in, in, this was in England, and they enjoyed it because, because, uh, because it was relevant. They, they had their courses all ready for when they went back. But also, as uh, the third point, uh, just to wrap up, is also peer learning. They, they were happy to be together uh, because p teachers often don't get, um, uh, you, you know, uh, praised or simply attention is not paid to them. And when they're, they're working together, they who like to give a lot to their students like also to be valued. So that, that's the, my conclusion. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. any, and anybody we, we miss? Uh, yes, we have Gabrielle for the last group. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, quickly, because a lot of things have been uh, told, it's just uh, regarding the, the need of interaction. So uh, as some of, uh, as uh, I've already mentioned, it can be done with, uh, through a feedback, through uh, working with peers, through uh, moderators. So we, 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 we mentioned that in our group, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, the training needs to be customized at uh, the own pace of the, of, uh, the different participants, uh, that's all. So interactions. All right, excellent. Uh, well, thank you for your contribution. I hope you enjoyed the little um, uh, breakouts, you know, virtual. But hopefully, you got a chance to uh, meet a few people that way as well. Um, so I'll close that whiteboard. That's another uh, feature here. And let's go back to uh, our presentation um, here. So, you know, I think you mentioned that I had created some of those aspects, some of those points here. You mentioned that and, um, you know, interaction, uh, Q&A, the ability to ask questions and get answers, collaboration, learning from the peer group. Uh, what we find as well that's uh, very successful is uh, storytelling. You know, when you have a chance, especially in leadership programs, as an executive to share your leadership journey or leadership story, uh, we find that, um, uh, it engages people quite a bit. 
Um, obviously, it has to be relevant to you, helps you in your job. Uh, we are looking at um, the notion of um, you know, engaging in activities, doing things, getting feedback, as you mentioned, and uh, ultimately, this notion of uh, experiential learning, where the idea is that you, you do things, uh, you learn by doing, then you reflect on what you've done, and you learn from the feedback and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the results of your actions. So that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, areas that you identified and that we see as well. So the next question is really, if you think about these factors, um, can we embed, can we create these types of factors um, in online learning as easily as uh, we can in face-to-face uh, -face, uh, environments? So for that, I propose that we consider uh, different modalities in terms of uh, how you interact with people. So if you start from the uh, bottom of the slide, you know, uh, when you're on your own, uh, online, you know, on your computer, and which is typically where a lot of the original e-learning uh, is rooted, you know, uh, basic e-learning often has been uh, associated with compliance training, training in large uh, numbers. And so you get uh, people to access resources online and simply read or maybe watch videos. Uh, so that's one, one, one aspect. Uh, then just like you experienced in the small group that we created, uh, the idea of having a, a web meeting with two, three, you know, four, five people uh, where you get to collaborate, to discuss, to get feedback, learn from your peers. Um, you know, that's a, that's a way to um, organize parts of a training online. And then in a large group, like a webinar, you know, you can be using that to uh, tell stories, certainly take questions from the audience, learn from subject matter experts. Um, so these are different ways you can think of when you design a program online. And uh, directionally, I would say the engagement level varies. We find that, you know, when you're on your own, sometimes it's a little bit, uh, I think, um, uh, Elliot was mentioning that, you know, sometimes it's a little bit less engaging. Uh, you feel a little bit lonely, maybe you don't have direct interaction. Uh, then in a small group setting, often uh, it's quite a lot of interactivity, so it can be quite engaging. And in a large group, you know, it's, uh, I would say, in between. So the question is, let's think about uh, how do we design a program that uh, combines probably these three elements? And we see that a lot in leadership um, development programs, the ability to combine those different components to create uh, an engaging learning journey or experience. So for instance, it could be uh, before you join the program or at different touch points, you're going to read articles, watch videos, you know, really learn. Then as you get together, uh, we're going to break you up into small teams and it could be just like we did with the virtual breakouts or it could be uh, in separate meetings in between webinars and give you assignments and have a, uh, give you a chance to collaborate. Um, and, and you know, a lot of things that we do traditionally in a face-to-face -face type of program um, has already these types of breakouts. You know, often we have actually uh, programs that we run in uh, hotels where you have breakout rooms. Uh, so if you think online, uh, there are lots of activities you could do like that. For instance, you know, on uh, leadership programs, we uh, often have like um, an assessment, whether it's a Myers-Briggs or a different type of uh, personality assessments, you could very well uh, you know, receive your report and then debrief with a small team uh, on uh, you know, what, uh, what you've learned about yourself uh, and have a dialogue around that. Uh, sometimes it's uh, around uh, communication and presentation skills. So you could use you know, a small team to, um, a little bit like Ludivine was saying, you know, to practice a pitch, for instance, um, and get feedback from the others in the group. Uh, we've done that sometimes with actors that we bring in and they, they role play with you and as an observer and you can get feedback. A uh, small, small group can be good also for action learning with project work, uh, you know, working together on a, on a project. And so this can be done online uh, with the today's capabilities. And then the large group with a webinar, uh, obviously that's what we're doing now. So this is something that can be done. And if it's uh, 
fairly, um, you know, think about it if you have like 20, 30 people, make it as interactive as possible with the use of uh, uh, Q&A breakouts in the middle of the, of the webinar as well, just like we're doing now. So the notion is a little bit about uh, the flipped classroom, you know, if you're familiar with that. The idea is like, let's do the, the learning at our own pace, leverage the flexibility of online to uh, read and watch what's needed based on the content of this program. But then let's leverage the time we have together uh, to really uh, look at applying and experiencing uh, and deepening our knowledge of, of the topic. So that's, that's the idea I would suggest, you know, consider uh, whenever you're thinking of potentially taking some of your content online, uh, can you structure it by looking at these types of dimensions and as much as possible, um, look at the small group component and, and try to emphasize that as much as possible. So then there's a question about how do we address the needs of senior level audiences? And, uh, you know, originally, again, uh, online learning typically has been for like um, a large base of employees, not necessarily very senior. Uh, and if you think about the more senior audiences, uh, there are some specifics, you know, in terms of uh, unique uh, needs of theirs. Clearly, there is a lot of pressure on their time and agendas. So uh, maybe online would be better than on-site in that sense. Um, in fact, you know, it's actually sometimes you also have uh, leaders who are asked to participate, not necessarily as an attendee, but more as a mentor, you know, in, a, in an executive program or leadership development program. And what we find is that with some clients, you know, when we run the program at their headquarters, they tend to have um, more, ability, uh, more ability to secure executive speakers for that program. But if it's happening off-site somewhere far from headquarters, it's much more difficult to get a speaker. Well, if it's online, it's actually easier uh, potentially to get uh, executives, you know, to dedicate some of their time to address uh, an audience. But also if they are participants, you know, for them, they will save all the travel time and so forth. So online could actually be good for developing senior uh, folks uh, in the organization. Now, when it comes to the need for collaboration, uh, one could argue that this need is even greater uh, for, you know, mid to senior level uh, managers and talent. Uh, there's a well-known phenomenon in organization is that as you move up the ladder, uh, you tend to be more and more isolated, uh, you know, because you have a team reporting into you, but you don't necessarily have um, so many people to connect with at the same kind of level. So in that sense, the, you know, the need for peer collaboration, uh, the higher up you are, is very much valued. So in that sense, maybe on-site is better than online, but, you know, if you have to do it online, I I think what it means is really make sure you do have a strong uh, collaborative aspect to your online program with senior level audiences. Uh, and then the last one is, uh, you know, typically uh, senior level uh, managers and leaders, uh, they require truly engaging content, challenging content, you know, they get bored quickly, they already have uh, no, no a lot, so make sure that your program is uh, properly paced and challenging. And I think, again, uh, make them participate. Uh, and I think that's a good way to uh, uh, create engagement here. So what I wanted to show you is an example of how you bring these different modalities together. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of um, creating a learning journey. So that's, that's an example of a, a program we've deployed with, with a client that uh, this one was called Building Innovation and Agile Mindsets. The audience uh, are um, senior level um, executive director and VPs in an industrial company. And the way we set it up uh, was with what you see, you know, the circles here are webinars. So we had a group of about 30 people and we did four webinars over a two week um, duration. So it's uh, essentially uh, two webinars per week. So there was the kickoff at the beginning where you introduced the program objectives. Uh, we used the business simulation in that, uh, in that particular journey. And people had access to um, self-study, so e-learning modules. And then we asked them to uh, work in small teams on the business simulation. 
to essentially complete one uh, one year of activity in the simulation. So this gave uh, a little bit of flexibility because they, as a small team, they had about uh, two days to find the time, you know, to uh, block maybe an hour and a half together. And then in the next webinar, we would review, you know, the results of their simulations and uh, guide them with additional information and kicking off the next round, um, which continued here with the review of the second round. So same, same process here. So that was really the experiential component here in pink. Uh, in blue, you know, it's more the learn piece. And then finally, we moved to the green uh, color, which is more about application. So they, they had seen a lot of innovation and uh, strategic frameworks uh, and agility frameworks through the, the process. And then they had a chance to apply that, uh, also working in small teams uh, to uh, make progress on their own business um, with, uh, with that approach using those frameworks. And then uh, the final webinar was where the teams were presenting their outcome uh, and they were pitching, you know, their winning ideas here. So similar to, uh, we talked about pitching earlier, you know, so that's what they were doing uh, online. Uh, and very interactive, you know, we could still have participants vote for the best ideas. And so that, that uh, made it a good, a good success. Um, so that's just an example, you know, we have um, here the flexibility of spreading what would otherwise be a two day workshop over two weeks which gives more flexibility to participants. You know, they essentially have uh, one week, one hour uh, webinars to attend twice a week and then more flexibility to work with their small team during the rest of the week. Um, we have sometimes clients who say, look, you know, we had two days planned for face-to-face. -face. Right now, because of the situation, we want to keep those two days but do everything online, which we can do as well. Uh, but I would say, you know, if, um, if it's planned ahead and it's going to be online, you may as well take, take advantage of the flexibility of online to spread it across a longer duration uh, so that there is more flexibility for every participant. So here maybe um, wanted to check if you have other um, best practices or uh, things that you have used or seen when it comes to exciting online training. And uh, uh, maybe let's just uh, open it up to everyone here. If you, if you want to share some best practices, just unmute yourself and jump in with some, uh, some experience you, you, you'd like to share because you think it was really effective online training. Uh, Philippe, uh, Jacques Piquet, I can give uh, what we did in uh, with Schneider Electric, where we use a lot uh, e-learning. We even had uh, a KPI on e-learning to encourage people to move from uh, on-class training to e-learning. And what, what I said to the group uh, uh, before, what was very positive is uh, instead of to be alone in uh, you know your online training and uh, uh, isolated, and finally not to share um, uh, learning with others, we invited. Uh, uh, systematically an expert uh, for a topic. So we make some interruptions, some breaks, and we share the learnings all together. And after each module, if I can say in, in French, we have this uh, uh, collective discussion to share the learnings and, and specifically to bring some uh, example and testimony about the topic we are talking, for example, safety or, uh, you know, uh, uh, or this, this, this kind of topic. So it's much more powerful uh, instead of to be alone, and you learn from uh, the other uh, background and experience. Thank you, Jacques. Yeah, that's excellent. I, I think that that's uh, very powerful. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, curated content as well out there. So sometimes it's uh, you can use curated content on different topics, but just bringing a discussion forum at the back end of that to connect the dots, see what people uh, learn from it and connect it to the business is very powerful. So thanks for sharing that example. And, and other, other best practices, uh, anybody? Uh, in a much smaller scale than what Jacques uh, referred, but I think uh, quick polling every so often, like the use of polls, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but just for a quick feedback during a webinar or I find it very effective because it's just like taking the pulse <laughs> of your audience and seeing uh, how they're leaning towards uh, in a topic or in the way you're approaching a topic. I find it very uh, valuable. 
Very good. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because there are technologies that en enable us to do things that we cannot do in the more traditional setting. Uh, so polling is one that uh, online enables very quickly. So thank you. I'd, I'd like to add one thing that we've done in a series of webinars that I help arrange, which is to pre-plan moments where you can ask for a question or even have a pre-planted question because it gives the speaker, the main speaker, a little break and causes people to re-engage with the material because um, they're probably multitasking on their computer and when they suddenly hear another voice and, and are invited to ask a question midway, it, it helps people uh, stay alert. But to leave that to chance doesn't work. It's, it's best to, when you're making your presentation to plan for those moments. Right, yep, agreed. Thank you. Okay, so well, thanks for sharing those tips. And um, definitely, um, I think um, uh, it's evolving fast. I think the more experience we get with these types of technologies, the more uh, confidence we have. Um, and so the technology does enable a lot of good things. Uh, you know, for instance, we were talking about these virtual breakout rooms. Um, you can actually easily, as the facilitator, visit, you know, the, those rooms virtually and jump from one to the next and see what's happening. And I've found that it was uh, actually more effective uh, for us than, you know, running around different physical breakouts sometimes because you can quickly monitor what's happening in the different rooms and see when people may need a little bit of help uh, at a glance. So um, that's just another example. So when it comes to supporting technologies, you know, the, the thing is that um, compared to when we started 15 plus years ago with, uh, with online learning, I mean, there's a, a lot of fantastic tools that have become available now. Uh, right now, you know, web meeting platforms like the one we're using, Zoom, for instance, uh, with those features, uh, very effective and simple. Uh, you have things like Adobe Connect, uh, WebEx. Um, Microsoft Teams uh, currently does not still have virtual breakouts, so probably less, uh, less uh, relevant. Um, but, you know, at the same time, for a small meeting, uh, if you insert small meetings as part of your program, and you're using Microsoft Teams uh, in your company, you may as well still uh, use that for those small meetings. But in a, in a webinar, I would probably um, uh, prefer something else. And then you, you can have uh, websites and learning management system tools supporting your course. Uh, sometimes we find that our clients have complex learning management systems and they'd like to have something that can be tracked, but that is uh, on an outside platform that can connect. So I know Adobe Connect has solutions there. We are using some uh, startup uh, called Elucidat for developing a website specific to uh, a, a client program uh, or solutions like um, LMS that are pretty light, like My Skills Camp or Intrepid, another company that helps to transpose your uh, content online. Then, you know, one technology that um, uh, based on, on your program audience and objectives uh, lends itself very well to uh, being deployed online uh, is the one of business simulations. And uh, you know, this is a, a domain where we have a lot of experience in because we create some of those simulations. And so I wanted to share a little bit more with you uh, about that. Um, and I think a couple of you mentioned that as well as key factors earlier on. So you know, by definition, uh, we're talking here about simulations. You know, there are lots of um, uh, ways of doing them. Sometimes people call a role play a simulation. Here we're talking about computer-based simulations and because they are computer-based, they are easy to deploy online uh, as well. So what are we talking about here? Uh, typically, uh, first, you know, uh, a simulation is going to be uh, an environment that's a little bit like a case study. You know, you're faced with, um, you work in a small team and you step into a company, a fictitious company, but realistic one, and you're going to make decisions as a management team and then see the results of your decisions and we'll run that several times over the course of the program. So as if you think about the, what you have on the right hand side here, different learning modalities uh, and from left to right, you know, more or less engaging or interactive. 
And then on the vertical one is really the level of impact and retention. And we find that uh, you know, simulations are more engaging than uh, case studies that are a bit more static. And uh, ultimately you're frustrated because you may have good recommendations, but you don't know what would have happened if your recommendations would have been uh, implemented. So the simulation gives an opportunity for a group to collaborate, ideate, get feedback, learn and adapt, and uh, keep pushing for typically business growth. So, you know, it's in fact very similar to the new ways of working that are being um, requested today in our fast moving environments where we talk about new agile ways of working. Uh, the idea is that small teams, autonomous small teams, typically cross-functional, have to make more and more decisions and do that in a very uh, fact-based way, you know, critical thinking, looking at the data they have, forming hypotheses based on those, make their decisions, then get the feedback and adjust as needed. Uh, so lots of uh, skills areas where these tools are very good. And what's very uh, interesting as well is that you can connect a high performance team or the quality of your teamwork and business performance, you know, so a good way to reinforce both soft skills and hard skills of leadership. So this is just to give you a feel, an example when it's on site. So you have like those teams, um, you know, each has a team table, they have a computer hooked to, to a larger monitor. So when you, do, when you do this online, we typically have smaller size teams. Instead of five or six people, we have like three or four people because it's more flexible for them to schedule time together. But there are some benefits compared to face-to-face -face in the sense that everybody has their screen so they can all see all the data very easily. Um, and, you know, again, they have the flexibility to schedule when they want to do these types of uh, meetings between webinars that are already scheduled for them in the program. So as a recap, you know, we're talking about uh, to make your online learning engaging, make sure you build interactivity, collaboration, and as much as possible, an experiential components in there. Um, so uh, I wanted to point to additional resources as well, and you'll get a copy of that at the end of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, there is a very um, short and uh, practical article uh, in Harvard Business Review on engaging meetings, which uh, you know, is valid for any type of meeting, including certainly training programs. Um, we have a white paper on experiential learning. Uh, if you're curious, you can access that as well. If you like those virtual breakouts and you use Zoom, you know, there's a little tutorial here to uh, help you do it in your next uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, and we've added some security tip on Zoom because unfortunately, uh, given the success of Zoom, some of these meeting, uh, meetings can be disrupted by outsiders if you don't uh, secure your meeting properly. And then if you're uh, even more curious, I just wanted to uh, flag something uh, briefly, uh, which is um, an online a learning challenge that we're organizing the week of April 20th. Uh, so the topic is developing innovation and agile mindsets, similar to the program I was explaining to you earlier. Uh, and here the idea is it's an open program where different companies can sign up a team of up to four people and over the course of the week, they'll have three one-hour webinars, but in between, they will have uh, teamwork around the simulation, uh, an innovation simulation. Uh, and so if you want to uh, you know, enroll some teams because they are supposed to be uh, becoming more agile and innovative, that can be uh, a small experiment you can run and then decide whether you want to scale that later on. So we wanted to offer that to help some of our clients test uh, this idea of uh, taking a program uh, totally online. All right, so thanks for your attention. Uh, let's see if you have questions um, at this point overall. Oh, I just wanted to know if the participation in that uh, event that you just mentioned, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, if, if there's a cost associated with it. Yes, there is a cost. It's, uh, so we're charging uh, $1,000 per participant. So for a team of four, it's $4,000. So Thank you. Um, that's the cost. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Philippe, we have a question from uh, Fabienne. 
Yes. Hello. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Question, because a lot of things we said today is um, also valid um, for in-person meetings and learning and so on. So what is really, really different? What has to be really paid a lot of attention on, on online versus um, in person because collaboration, engagement, experiential, and so on and so on, breakout rooms, you know, a lot is common. So I'm curious about what is really critical. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good, very good question. I think the message I wanted to convey is that um, these are critical components and they can be uh, embedded in your online program. So I just wanted to challenge uh, maybe the thinking associated with the traditional online courses, the way they've been done from the beginning of online learning uh, and, and say, look, you know, as we are now moving towards more and more uh, programs being offered online, even for more senior level audiences, do make sure you challenge the conventional approach to online training to include meetings, to include all these components that the technology makes easy to orchestrate these days. So that's, uh, I would say that's, that's the main message. Make sure you leverage uh, the fact that current technology enables you to drive a lot of interaction online as well, especially with um, having small groups in addition to your webinars. Okay, it's perfectly clear. Thank you. Yeah, you can, now we have the luxury of having everything we can do in person online. Thank you. Exactly, because some people are still uh, uh, thinking that online is really boring. And so we want to change that, that perception. Uh, Philippe, we also have a question from Karine. Yes. So people, hi. So people talk about sort of the water cooler moment. You know, a lot of what goes on when you're at a conference or you're at an event or whatever happens not in the room where the person is speaking with you, but it happens outside of that room. How do you, how or can you, or do you believe that you can recreate those sort of water cooler? Uh, impulsive interactions that happen outside of the actual room itself. Any thoughts on that? Because those can sometimes be the most impactful of the entire program. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, so I, my, my thoughts on that are uh, that you can use those uh, virtual breakouts uh, in many ways. So, you know, make sure you, uh, you have several of those. Uh, you could, you know, build a break in between different segments, but you do that at the back end of the virtual breakout so that if people want to stay, you know, within their breakout and, and continue to chat, for instance, during the break time, that, uh, that lends itself to this conviviality of a small group. Something that's also interesting, um, and we do that when we do face-to-face -face programs, but you can do it also virtually, is to reshuffle people when you do the breakouts. Mm -hmm. You can easily, in, in fact, with Zoom, you can almost, you, you can automatically, if you want, reshuffle people in the next breakouts, uh, or you can assign them. But by doing that, you create more intimate connections with more people and probably more opportunities for these types of uh, water cooler exchanges. And also um, using icebreakers, I would imagine, so that they don't have to figure out on their own how to do it? Yes, yes. Definitely a, a good idea too, yeah. Uh, Philip, we have a question from Marion about outdoor development. Marion? Uh, yes, I was curious as to where you would put that on your scale of engagement and involvement when people are doing outdoor development. Um, well, are you talking about, I mean, we, uh, field, uh, field exploration, these kinds of things, or what do you mean by outdoor development? Um, I've worked on a number of programs where there was um, outward bound type exercises in teams and groups. Um, the idea being to challenge people in environments which they weren't accustomed to, uh, environments which would be challenging and leadership would rotate in the particular group and then there would be some feedback. I just wondered what you thought in terms of, you were talking about learning, engagement, involvement, where you would put that outdoor development. Yeah, yeah no, the, we, we use that in some of our programs. And I would say that's definitely, if it's well um, formatted with a clear purpose and, and to Jacques point earlier as well with a, a debriefing of the experience of different people when they come back, very uh, very engaging 
And uh, you know, if you convert that into two days environment, if we had to do that like tomorrow, um, well, I guess it's a little bit more limited right now, but I would say even if uh, in a few months time, we still have restricted travel, we could still have participants uh, go out on a mission to visit you know, and explore different things that are relevant to the business and then come back and debrief uh, online you know, their experience. I, I would think that would be quite engaging, All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um, yes, could I uh, ask just one question? Sure. Um, from Luisella, um, what are the best technical tools? Because I'm quite uh, not up with the technical uh, aspects. W what, what are you, you mentioned them before, but which ones do you especially recommend, please? So yeah, you'll get that slide you know, here. So uh, sorry, the one on the, on the tools here. We had. Um, so you, you know, I would say start with things as simply uh, as simple as Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings. You can do a lot with that uh, already for uh, engaging people online. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to thank you uh, for your active participation, and um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out if you have additional questions. Again, you'll receive material on this from uh, Ludivin. Uh, but uh, I'm only a phone call away and uh, happy to continue the conversation later on. Thank you, Philippe, for sharing your expertise. Uh, thank you all for your attention. We hope this uh, webinar provided you valuable information on engaging learning experiences. Uh, we'll be sharing the slides uh, of the presenter with you uh, later this afternoon, as uh, Philippe um, said, and we'll also share a, a survey with you. Um, FACNI is offering three webinars in the 10 uh, upcoming days uh, on various topics linked to uh, COVID-19. Tomorrow, uh, one about the CARES Act, another one on the 15th about uh, immigration updates in the context of COVID-19, and one on Thursday, April 16th on employment practices in times of virtual work. Uh, we will also have uh, the next session of uh, FACNI's uh, HR Forum, um, which is uh, led by uh, Jack Goldenberg, who was uh, on, the, on the call today uh, on Thursday, April 28th. Uh, if you are a human resources professional, you qualify to, to next this meeting. Don't hesitate to, to contact uh, me uh, for more um, information. This webinar was made uh, possible thanks to um, the support of uh, FACNI sponsors. We thank you for your attention. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.